This is literally just a dude afraid to death that fiction was a little scary. With that all said, let's go ahead and get to talking about Turning Red. And I'm not talking about doing a review of Turning Red uh, the same way that I did the review of the Sonic movie. Um, as, as much as somebody might enjoy that, uh, I am not so enthusiastic about that film to, to, to do that. I'm not going to become a film review channel. I'll talk about Blue Hedgehogs, though. I have, I have a problem with Blue Hedgehogs. Anyways, let's get into the fan art, and then let's get into that topic. The first one here is from Blue Feather. It's Cirrus Cat Girl Soda. I, uh, I don't know how to feel about this, but it's certainly a thing uh, that exists now. So that's a thing. The next one we have is from Burger. They said, I've been sitting on this idea for a hot minute, finally got around to doing this during the episode that was posted today, and joined just to throw this on here. Took me about an hour. Anyways, uh, I thought we were due for more Pony Cirrus, so I took it upon myself, or upon myself, uh, to knock this one out. Uh, do pardon if I lurk a bit. I'm usually really busy, so I miss a lot of messages unless I'm tagged. Cheers. Small edit. Uh, sir, so if you get a chance to read this, there's something else I want to thank you for. I've grappled with polyamory my entire life, but thought the only way I could handle a relationship in an honest way was through monogamy. Your content and mentions of your household have helped normalize the idea of a polycule in my mind, and I'm feeling a lot better about it and less like some kind of greedy perv. So, thank you. They also said there's a side of the cartoon, uh, side of the carton that says, honestly, sirs, your content and your personality are quite enjoyable, and I really hope this carton of cat boy milk finds you well. Keep being a really cool person. I know you to be. Well, thank you very much, Burger. Burger Mama. I appreciate it. And thank you for the wonderful artwork. The next one we have, and the last one for the day, what's well, the last two, really, are from Mathematical Cabbage. Had a very quick sketch of a Catboy Cirrus in a swimsuit and a plus-size Cirrus rocking the Virgin Killer sweater. And both are wonderful. As always, everyone, thank you for the fan art submissions. If you want your fan art to be shown in a future episode, the best way to do so is to drop it into the fan art section of the Discord. And with all that said... Let's get into the actual, actual topic at hand. So, this is a pastor's warning about the new Disney Pixar film, uh, Turning Red. So, let's go ahead and take a look at what we got here. Mike Signorelli, you are senior pastor of V1 Church in New York City. How's it going today? Hey, it's a great day here in Queens. I'm in New York City. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, the reason I'm having you on, we're diving into this topic of Turning Red, this new Pixar and Disney movie. Now, you put out a fairly long video on this, a really interesting commentary on the film, and you said a number of things, but one thing you said was, this is not a children's movie. What yes, it is. I'm sorry, Turning Red is definitely a kid's film. It, if, if you haven't seen the movie, I do suggest going to see it. Um, the most non-kid thing that happens in that film is uh, there's a mention of a girl's period once. And um, last I checked, 12 and 13 year olds are kids. So, eh? What led you to that conclusion? Well, you know, I believe that every parent, not just a pastor, but a parent has a mandate to actually screen material, you know, because every single device you have in your home uh, is a portal, either a window into the things of God or unfortunately things that I believe are demonic. And so, you know, as a pastor and a parent, I have an elementary school aged kid. I was like, I, you know, this this is a Pixar film. It's obviously going to be watched by millions and millions of people. I uh, Necro, uh, Neko Crest, thank you very much for resubscribing. Uh, and also, I, I so I agree with the I agree with the statement on its surface uh, that as a parent you do have a job to screen material for your kids. Um, but as a parent, also you have a responsibility to not. What's the best way to put this? To not freak out about that material. So as as an example, um. When I was a kid, I was told that I couldn't play Resident Evil because, I mean, the reasons I was given weren't even that it was rated M. It was because it said uh, evil 
on on the title. Now, despite the fact that I knew because I had friends that really loved the series. Um, I knew that the series' name was actually Biohazard, and it wasn't called Resident Evil until we brought it over to the States because uh, a combination of legal and marketing reasons. But I wasn't allowed to play initially because it, it said evil. It just said evil. I went to a Christian private school, um, and... There were all kinds of things that they said were evil and, and terrible. Pokemon being one of the biggest ones uh, in there. Yu-Gi-Oh! was just coming around as I was getting into middle school. So I managed to have a couple of years where we were able to trade cards without people really knowing what the hell was going on. But the point is... Yes, parents do have a responsibility to screen material that their kids are going to watch. But at the same time, you as a parent also have a responsibility to not freak the fuck out over little things that do not in fact matter and are not in fact problems. Like parents who freak out about talking to their kids about gender. Your child had to read a book in school at one point, I'm certain, where a character was named either a he or a she. Your child learned about gender that day, Karen. Jesus. Anyway, I want to know what I'm exposing my kid to. And within the first eight minutes, I was absolutely appalled. So so let's talk about how those were first you eight. Wait, how were you appalled? I, I know he's going to explain that, but like. In, in what way? How was the first eight minutes of Turning Red appalling? How do you sit there and pearl clutch so heavily? <gasps> the kids movie, it's doing something that makes me mildly uncomfortable. <gasps> Save the kids. Shadow Thirst, thank you very much for redeeming your points for an... You fucking monster. Anyway minutes what and by the way in your video you really go i mean you show clips you go in depth on this but what was the thing that this feels like an anime exposed thing where they show clips of things and don't give actual context uh maybe we'll actually go and watch his full video uh later on and see what what the hubbub is about disturbed you the most at the beginning of the film yeah, well, full disclosure, the video's already been banned on YouTube in all countries, um, which was kind of to be expected. I took a risk and just felt like I had a responsibility to share uh, the theological perspective on this. It's still up on Facebook for the time being. We'll see how long that lasts. But, you know, really, it is it. Do you think maybe his video's banned because he didn't do the bare minimum required to avoid getting smacked by copyright? When you say the video's banned on all these platforms, um, but you don't give the reason why I'm like 90% certain you are either lying or the movie was removed for copyright reasons. I I'm like 95% and it's got copyright reasons. If anybody in chat wants to find the video that he has on Facebook and see if he actually took like any measures whatsoever to avoid copyright problems with that video, uh, that will pro that would be incredibly helpful. Um, new release. Thank you very much for redeeming your points for an owl. Oh well, owl. Oh well. It's giving like an Eastern perspective. And, and so the problem though I have is that number one, it's a coming of age piece. And so it's essentially about a girl experiencing, you know, her monthly cycle. And then as a result of that, there's all this spiritual connection to, you know, ancestral communication, which is communication with the dead. We know in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 27, it's appointed once to live and then to die and we face judgment. And it's strictly forbidden in the Christian context to communicate with the dead. And so even within the first eight minutes, you have chanting, communication with ancestors, and immediately a red flag should start to go off. Okay, so here's what's actually happening there. Here's what's actually happening there, my guy. A different culture has different religious practices, and it made you really uncomfortable. I understand that there's a whole bunch of like, ah, they're talking with the dead. Ah, it sounds so evil. No, literally all that's happening here is that ancestral veneration, which is a common thing in many Eastern cultures, happened. And it made you freak the fuck out. 
Because the idea that other cultures who have just as valid religious practices as you do is scary. I know that he wants to hide behind the idea that, no, I'm doing this because uh, if you read the Bible and you read this specific passage in the Bible, it actually justifies my position. No. What happened is you, as an adult, played the part of a child and you were introduced to something that scared you. And it might have scared you because you read a book that told you it's supposed to scare you. But at the end of the day, you were confronted with something that made you uncomfortable. And instead of articulating why it made you uncomfortable, you fell behind your book. It's a lot like when Christians like to be homophobic and then rely very heavily on their book to give them reasons why it's okay for them to think that gay people are icky when really the problem was that gay people were icky to them. That was the whole problem to begin with. There was something that made them feel like they were gross. And to explain that feeling, they read their book where it said that it was justified because something, something, they're going to hell. I'm sorry, but this idea, I understand that from the Christian perspective, the Bible is the be all and end all of everything. But when I was a when I was a child, when I went to Pensacola Christian Academy, when I would be told these things in media were evil, I tended to have counter arguments. And the reason for that. I'll give the example. I, I was told Pokemon was evil, demonic, terrible, even Yu-Gi-Oh was evil, demonic, horrible. But with Pokemon, when I watched that show, I went, this is a show about friendship and self-discovery. Th that's all it is, at least, you know, back in the Indigo series. That's all it was. And I kept thinking to myself, if only I could show a couple of episodes to the kids in my class, to the teachers in the school, they would understand that the thing they're freaking the fuck out about isn't a big deal. And then when it came to Yu-Gi-Oh, I literally an actual I, I remember this happening. Um, I was I was playing Yu-Gi-Oh with a friend of mine and we were we both went to the same school. We both went to the same school. Um, I left the school, went to middle school. He stayed in the school, but we played Yu-Gi-Oh together. And I remember the moment when his parents took his cards away. And it was in the show where Merrick Ishtar is fighting against, I believe it was against Yugi, but it might have been against Joey. And Merrick summoned Hell Poemer. And it was one of the few things four kids did not censor. So Hell Poemer came out and the card, I mean, it looks like an undead, you know, monster. That's not the thing. It's that he said hell. And the parents, they freaked out immediately, took all of their cards away, threw them away. And it was it was, you know, my my friend and his little brother, the little brother ended up getting whole on indoctrinated. I'm not going to say his name because he's seen a couple episodes of my channel. He might be seeing this one, um, but he just got full on culture indoctrinated, cult indoctrination from that point. Like he still believes to this day as an almost 30 year old that the earth is 6000 years old. Like he's fallen full on into that cult. Um the other friend I lost complete contact with. But what what was funny to me is that me and that friend had the exact same thought. We we're like, OK, so let me get this straight. The villain of the show, the bad guy used a monster with the name hell in it. The bad guy, the guy we're not supposed to emulate, the guy who is evil insofar as Merrick could even be considered that. The bad guy did a bad thing, and that's why the cards were taken away, because the bad guy did a bad thing on the TV show. And when you actually think about the mechanics involved there, you're like, oh, wait, hold on. The villain did something wrong. Uh, therefore, we, we punished our kids. Do you punish your kids for watching G.I. Joe because Cobra is a fascist? Like... 
Yeah, this is what happens when a parent can't separate fiction from reality. If you want to ban media from your kid because the villain does something uh, that involves the word hell, then maybe ban the Bible from your child, a similar fiction where hell is talked about a lot, even if you don't consider it fiction. It is still media where hell is talked about in the negative. This is no different than what's happening there in Yu-Gi-Oh! And again, this is a 4Kids version. It's actually tamer than what we got in, uh, in Japan. But anyway, point is, I've seen this shit happen in real time where, like, the parents, they have the, the switch gets hit. They've watched a bunch of this media up to this point. It's never bothered them. And then just a random thing happens. And they're like, that one's Satan. That one's bad. It happened with my mom, too. We we would watch the Harry Potter movies, and she loved them. And then the third... No, the fifth movie happened. And Bellatrix Lestrange is shown in the newspaper. And when my we're in the theater, and my mom sees that, my mom sees Bellatrix Lestrange on you know, the newspaper in in uh, in the Hogwarts uh, lunchroom and she sees a villain acting crazy and she goes, this is satanic. That is satanic. That looks demonic. And it was one of the biggest moments of of me having to slap my head and just go, Mom. Like, we never had a conversation about that particular instance. Because it never ultimately mattered past that point. But it's it's that it's that switch flipping where like they suddenly see a thing happen that makes them go, ah, the pastor man was right. This is the bad thing. And I'm supposed to not like it. It's the same thing here. You've got somebody who sees another religion practiced in another region of the world and immediately goes, my religion says they're evil. So the fictional characters on my TV screen, they are bad and they make me feel bad. It's the fallback on not thinking because it takes no energy. Yeah, it's literally your book told you it's bad. So you think it's bad. You can't give a, you can't give a good reason past that point. But unfortunately, there's millions of parents who are Christians and they'll they'll not even know that their kids watching it in the other room, and let alone even have the red flag to say, do I want my kid to be exposed to this as a gateway into maybe future adult uh, you know, interactions and beliefs uh, with something that the Christian faith condemns? All right. So let's go ahead and call this part what it is. Functionally, Christian zealots are scared that every fiction in the world that is written better than their fiction will make them like that fiction better. I know that there's actually like a philosophical conversation to be had here about how different religious practices are just as valid and we can, we can keep going down that route. But honestly, functionally, mechanically, what is happening here is a Christian parent is scared that the fiction that they hold dearly their kids gonna like something more than that and because it's not just a book to them it is an entire religious practice that is terrifying and it's terrifying because their pastor their friends their family have told them since day one that by engaging in media that is not just the bible they're going to go to hell so this is why you should never coddle your religious extremist. You never win. No, yeah, no, this is so this is why with stuff like this, um, when it comes to like philosophical conversations, uh, is God good? Is God evil? Does God exist? Stuff like that. Like those are conversations that I'm perfectly fine engaging in the philosophy on. I'm perfectly fine sitting down and synthesizing, you know, the 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 philosophy that I've read on stuff like this. But when it comes to this, when it comes to this post-mortem, mortem, mortem, post-mortem satanic panic stuff, I'm just going to call it what it is. It's cowardice. It's a bunch of adults being scared that other fiction is written better than theirs. There is so much deeper analysis that could be had there, but is it really deserved? 
Yeah, and it's and it's interesting because I know I've seen some people react and say, okay, well, you know, a lot of Disney movies, a lot of you know animated movies have these elevated themes, have you know elements of maybe not the occult, but I guess magic or make believe. What do you think sort of makes this film maybe different from some of the other ones out there? Yeah, well, here what I didn't want. If he's being consistent, there should be no difference. There should be zero difference. The only exception to this one is that it is new and people care. That is it. If he is being consistent, that is the only reason we should be given here. What I want to do is become a viral meme of the Christian that's trying to cancel Disney. You know, that overly emotional, radicalized Christian that... You're already that, but go on. All of your friends and co-workers can't stand. And I even said in my video, I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this. Uh, I, I have already. And you're going to enjoy every minute of it because your entire faith as it sits requires you to be persecuted. Literally, the hate you receive from this is a feature to you, not a bug. But again, continue. Um, but there's many more who are thanking me saying, um, my discernment needs to increase. And that was really my hope and prayer. But here's the thing, there's definitely a tipping point and there is a moment where you're like, they've gone too far. Now, if you extract the spiritual aspect of this movie, just on the basis of the content of being about, you know, menstruation and this coming of age, it's not appropriate for children on that. I'm all right. Can we can we talk about that for a second? A coming of age story where two, two passing mentions are made to menstruation Two. One of them where the mom has pads and goes, hey, uh, do you need these? Do you need your pads? And, you know, another one afterwards where like the grandma has one in a bag or something like a couple of passing mentions to a thing that, by the way, if your kid is 12 and, you know, was born female, they have experienced. You cannot, you categorically cannot say that this is not age appropriate for children when children experience it every fucking day. The only difference here is it's a coming of age story where the main character is a girl and therefore that plays into the narrative. The only way, yeah, I agree with Bregman. The only way this works is if they're calling 12 year olds adults, which is creepy as shit, but Everything else here, it is handled metaphorically. It is handled in a way that is, again, aside from the passing mentions that, you know, let people who are not analyzing the film greatly understand, oh, it's a metaphor for periods. Like, aside from the passing mentions there, most of the metaphor is light enough for it not to be an issue, for it to barely even register there. The girl turns into a panda. And... Who cares? It's a good movie, but who cares that she transforms into a panda, at least in terms of like freaking out to your audience? Again, I, I have to keep restating this point. If you want to argue that it is it is not age appropriate, it's not appropriate for kids to watch a movie that is metaphorically about coming of age and menstruating, then maybe you should take a little bit of time to learn human anatomy and understand that your 12 year old daughter has probably experienced a period. Guess what? By your logic, that natural thing that happened and was bound to happen and there was no control over was not age appropriate. Despite the fact that your God constructed your child's body in such a way that they would experience puberty at that age, while they are still a kid. You are saying your God is incorrect on what's age appropriate. Secularly educated, I have an English degree. I taught journalism and English. I can look at things from a secular perspective. Just on that basis alone, it's not appropriate for children. But again, now when you go past the eight minute mark into the 15 minute mark, there's this whole nightmare sequence 
And I'm telling you, it's disturbing to children, whether they're Christians or not, because the whole basis of it is demonic in its presentation. You have like ancestors with glowing red eyes. I showed the footage, uh, which is probably why it got blocked on YouTube. But then you even have spirits, literally these two demonic entities come out of a, a portrait and begin to swirl around. And this girl's being tortured, this child in her sleep. And it's just wildly inappropriate. And again, scary thing happens in movie, therefore not good for kid. Th literally, I, I said it earlier on. This is literally just thing was scary, made me uncomfortable, therefore bad, deserves hell. So Jesus, I hate how Christian conservatives have programmed themselves to be afraid of imagination. Yeah. This is literally just being afraid of fiction. This is literally just a dude afraid to death that fiction was a little scary. Oh, this post has never reviewed a Ghibli movie. Oh, he probably would never review a Ghibli movie because that would require him to accept that other cultures exist. And it should be offensive, but I, I think what happens is we're so desensitized that over time, things that used to be offensive to Christians, unfortunately, I think that we've become accepting of them and we ignore it. And that's really why I felt a burden to put the word out about this movie. All right. So the, the world changed and you decided to be the old man who yelled at a cloud. Sorry to play translator on there, but that's, that's again, functionally what's happened here. Um, but, but let's go ahead and talk about the idea of becoming desensitized to these things over time. Is this a thing that happens? Yes. There's a lot of things we were desensitized to at a certain point. Uh, child labor, we were pretty desensitized to at a certain point. Uh, slavery was a thing we were desensitized to at a certain point. We just accepted that these things were normal and that was not, at, that was not good. We had to get away from that. Now, 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 let's talk about the other side of this. Let's talk about a thing that was considered normal in the 80s. The satanic panic. The 80s into the 90s, the satanic panic was just considered the bog standard response here in the South. It was considered normal. The idea that I could not and should not talk about Pokemon to my grandparents, uh, to anybody that I, I knew in my local neighborhood uh, who may or may not be Christian, that was drilled into me a lot. I, it was normal to me. That is not a thing that should be normal. We should not be so afraid of fiction that makes us mildly uncomfortable that we find ourselves in that in that position where we freak out over the littlest things. You can make the argument about us becoming desensitized to these themes in literature, these themes in uh, in movies and stuff, but those themes have been in film for decades it's not that we're desensitized to it it's that you as a person are just now recognizing that you might have a problem with it and now you're talking about it but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of culture uh, has been desensitized to this point this is just the symptoms the uh, simpsons mean of like am i out of touch no no it's society that's wrong that's all this is when we are talking about something being appropriate or talking about something being good or bad, the way to go about it is not to say, my book says it's bad because somebody who doesn't care about your book is just gonna go, why should I care? What, that doesn't give me a reason to care. Somebody instead who is looking at this media with you, you're going to have to give them a rock solid reason why this is bad. Why is it bad to share scary imagery to, to a kid? The, the child is tortured. Okay, by what? An oppressive force? A force we're supposed to, to understand is something that doesn't necessarily have the kid's best interest at heart? Or is it metaphor for their own tortured existence because they're fighting between they're fighting between the idea of the red panda, this more animalistic side of themselves and that they see as obsolete and their childlike self, the, the self they want to maintain, the, the perfect person for everybody else. If we look at it as a metaphor, it's fine. If we look at it as actual demons coming out of hell to attack, well, now the story doesn't make any fucking sense. So it's not that. 
so we just kind of land on it's scary imagery. So you need to make an argument why scary imagery is bad. There's nothing wrong with a kid being scared. Yeah, I mean, the other day, it's interesting. I was in Barnes and Noble and, you know, I'm shopping and there's board games out and there's the Ouija board right in the middle of the board games, right? It's just prominently displayed in the middle of it. And I thought, wow, that's really, I don't remember. Of course, it's been in stores, but I, did, I didn't remember seeing it so prominently displayed. It seems like a lot of these different. It's, it's, hold on, let's see. How long have? Ba, 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 ba. Let's just check a thing here real quick. How Ouija boards went from spiritualist tool to children's toy. Ouija boards for girls fit right on toy shelves when it released in 2008. Uh, news of the product began to spread around the internet soon after. I was marketing cult kids. There was a boycott of Toys R Us and Hasbro in 2010. Hasbro is treating it as if it's just a game. Christian activist Stephen Flynn told Fox News it's now Monopoly. Ouija boards are fairly recent invention. Uh, they were an outgrowth of spiritualism, a 19th century religious movement. Be uh, the believed in communicating with the dead, among other types of early technology. Uh, they used to try to reach the deceased. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. In 1980 or 1890, three entrepreneurs decided to monetize the game. They secured a patent for the Ouija board uh, and started selling the wooden games for $1.5 a pop. Even though the board sold well, the original team dissolved after several years due to internal conflicts. So, you know, your actual problem is your actual issue is from what from what it seems. Capitalism. There's the actual problem, my guy. Capitalism. <laughs> it was marketable. Problem solved. Lucy Razor, thank you for bringing, uh, re redeeming your points for an owl. Owl. Uh, Zeta. Zeta Hagala, thank you for resubscribing. You've been here for three months. It was a toy in The Exorcist. It's a toy. Okay, so look, let's go ahead and, and, and be really honest and really insensitive here. It's always been a toy. If you truly think that a Ouija board will, in fact, let you communicate with the dead, then you have a very childlike perspective on the world. Ergo, fucking toy. I'm sorry. Ouija boards are not dangerous. They're not portals into hell. They're not portals into the occult. They are, in fact, toys. If you think they have actual spiritual power, then you need to find a way to demonstrate that. But here's the thing. Most Christians won't do that because they are too cowardly to do so. The Jar, thank you very much for redeeming your points for it. Nah, nah, nah. You fucking monster. And it, it's not an all Christians thing. Obviously, there are a lot of Christians who are logical, who don't sit here and think that a, a toy is going to cause all kinds of, of problems in the world. Different themes, which maybe in and of themselves, a one-off here or there might not seem concerning to people, but when you collectively sort of look, it seems like these sorts of themes that we're talking about, regardless of where people stand on this particular film, they're becoming more prevalent and more present in our lives. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think no, they're really not. Look, the idea that the occult, spiritualism, all the stuff is becoming more prevalent in media, it's as prevalent now as it's always been. At least for the last 40 or 50 years. Elsewise, you haven't been watching children's media for the last 40 or 50 years. But if we can play pretend, if we can pretend that the world is slowly shifting itself towards the evil and towards the demonic, we can continue to be mad at our imaginary enemy. Dark Fang, and thank you very much for redeeming your points, friend. Oh, well. Oh, well. Also, can I ask everybody, if I'm if I'm doing a segment, please have a little bit of patience with uh, with with your redeems. Understand that, like, I'm not going to stop mid sentence. I think you just nailed it because I have a 15 year old daughter and as a 15 year old, she's a teenager just interacting with the world. The other day, you have a 15 year old daughter. Guess what? She has a period. 
She said, Dad, why is it okay to be everything except for a Bible-believing Christian right now? It's perfectly okay to be a Bible-believing Christian. It's just not okay to be a, a bigot. Who, who honestly believes it's not okay to be a Christian? Please raise your hand if you honestly believe that. Please. Who honestly has, has fallen for that Fox News narrative that it's not okay to be Christian? 99% of the time, unless we're talking about the edgiest of fedora-tipping online atheists, nobody fucking cares. They don't. However, when you say being a Bible-believing Christian, there are certain statements that might entail. It might be that being a Bible-believing Christian to you means being an open-and-out homophobe or a racist. I, I can distinctly remember being told by a Christian adult in my lifetime when I had a crush on a black girl that... The races were not supposed to mix, and that was God's intention. So I have to say again, it depends on what you mean by being a Christian. If by being a Christian, you mean believing in God and reading your Bible and shaping your morals to be a lot more like Jesus's and a lot less like Herod's, then sure, that's fine. Nobody's going to stop you. Nobody cares. The only reason that they might get fed up with you is if you have a, uh, a mandate to proselytize to them, which turns out a lot of Christians do that. However, when it becomes an issue is when you start using your Christianity as a shield to just be a bad fucking person. And at that point, nobody's asking you to stop being a Christian. They're asking you to stop being a bad person. And that's what my, that, those are the words of my 15 year old. And she said, you know, Disney represents all cultures except for biblical Christianity and even other religions. And it's all represented in their film, but you won't. Um, wait, are really, do you honestly think there are, there's, there's no Christians at all in Disney films? And you say all religions except Christian? Really? Really? All religions except Christian. I need, I need an actual document of every religion that is showcased in Disney. I guarantee you we won't get there. And yeah, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Disney has Christians. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> sure. Where's the Pastafarian Disney movie? Yep see an overt Christian and she's picking up on the bias. The other thing is one of the lead contributors to Teen Vogue is a practicing open witch. And she actually has an article, it was released two years ago now, about the practical magic behind teenage menstruation blood. And so you see these things. Okay, so um, can I just say that one's fucking weird. Zaga says uh, that's just the deep south that forbids race mixing. That I have some I have some words for you. Uh, I grew up in the deep south, so yes, I understand that themes um, and the connection to the occult, to witchcraft. And again, my my daughter can read Teen Vogue magazine. She's not going to read scripture, but she can have an entire article about witchcraft connected to menstruation. And I'm not saying this for shock value. It's just me simply telling parents, this is what your kids are being exposed to, whether you realize it or not. And when you look at Exodus chapter 22, verse 18, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6, you have a very strict like ban and prohibition on sorcery, witchcraft, and God did not change. Like the new covenant did not eliminate, you know, that, that restriction, that banning of operating and being exposed to these things. Isn't it funny how, um, whenever somebody talks about new covenant and old covenant, they get to be really selective over the things that are good in the old covenant that need to be kept and the things that are bad in the old covenant uh, that don't need to apply anymore. Things like crossing fabrics and shellfish come to mind. And I know that you've heard those, you know, conversations, those arguments a thousand times, but it bears repeating. It feels like people get to be very arbitrary about what's important in the new covenant. While I do think that, yeah, it's weird that 
a, an article was written about the, the magical properties of children's menstrual blood. That's really fucking weird. Um, I'm I would need to read the article itself. I would need to read the article because I'm because I'm taking his words at face value. And if I've learned something about the people I respond to, it's that never take anything at face value. Grant the premise where you can, but if you don't have to sometimes. And when I think about the nation of Israel, you know, ancient Israel had bordering. Wait a minute. I have another question. How many Christians do you think write for Teen Vogue? Hold on. Teen Vogue literally has an entire section for Christianity and has Christian writers in it talking about, like, stereotypes that Christian teens are tired of hearing and shit like that. So wait a minute. It can be bad that they have a they have a practicing witch on their staff, but, like, we don't mention the Christians on their staff. Okay, sure countries and nations that were involved in witchcraft and sorcery and god was like it's possible to be in relationship with them and not actually co-opt and begin to be involved in the practices that they're doing and so you know listen we're not going to so you mean your kid could read teen vogue and not do the blood ritual and everything would be fine so long as your kid hasn't done any blood rituals, like, I don't know, um, drinking wine and, and eating stale crackers, uh, then I think, oh, God, I said that word on Twitch. Oh, God, I'm going to get banned. Um, but create our own little Christian bubble. It's possible to be in relationship with people. But um, Salem says practicing witch. Do these guys think they're actual people doing real witch magic out there? So as as somebody who does know people who pra uh, who, who are practicing witches, um like the the term practicing witch is a functional term like it's it's a real term while i don't think it does jack shit they do i don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that because i don't think they're hurting anybody that's my that's my thing it's the reason that i moved out of like the pure edgy atheist phase and just went into a more harm reduction phase because i'm i'm now in the position where i go okay in what ways does this hurt somebody? And that's what I care about, because I found awkwardly uh, that there are atheists who are just as if not more harmful than religious extremists. Uh, the the dumb fucking kangaroo comes to mind. Uh, rest in piss. It's what the problem occurs is when it, there's this mixing. And right now you see that Christians are reading their Bible, but also reading horoscopes. You see Christians who are, you know, believing God for deliverance and freedom from demons, but also going into and burning sage to cleanse their home. There's this intermingling that's happening. And I think this Pixar Disney situation is just another one of those gateway experiences. And to me, that should be so scary. Oh yeah, Salem. If we're talking about the uh, the the Christian idea of what a witch at, of what a witch is, then yeah, that's that's different. That's different. The idea that somebody's sitting there and they're going, um, you know what? I say this. I say that it's it's uh, there's 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 nobody sitting here uh, doing those extreme things. But I remember there is somebody that got kicked out of our Discord. Um, because we found that they were trying to curse other members of the Discord um, because they disagreed with their position. They literally, like, tried to do witch curses onto them. And we were just like, you know what? It's it's not that we think you can cause any harm by doing this. It's that you you intended to. So fuck off scary to those who don't know this is going on until they heard this talk right now. Well, and, you know, to your point, there have been a number of write-ups um, and, and a number of outlets about the fact that Gen Z, obviously we know about the depression, we know about all those issues. There's also this thirst for the spiritual connection, though. We know as Christians that that's what God puts in us, right, to connect with something with him. And so people try to fill that void in all different ways. And one of the ways it's being filled, and again, people can Google this, they can look it up. There have been plenty of stories in outlets that are not necessarily Christian outlets, they are turning to tarot cards. They're turning to all of these other things. And one other- My guy, they've been doing that for decades. They've been doing that for decades. All that's happened is that the idea that Christianity is the only valid faith that can be followed is slowly waning in society. And that's a good thing.
a society where different religions are allowed to intermingle and understand each other is a way better society than one where we have one dominant religion that everybody has to follow or they get told they're going to burn in hell point about what you were just saying you know in the old testament we obviously have the prohibitions if you look to the new testament and you go to Acts 16 one of the most fascinating stories that i had looked past so many times as i was reading was this slave woman who is following paul around driving him crazy and she's a fortune teller her owners would use her right to tell people's fortunes what does paul do he expels the demons she loses the ability to tell fortunes and so you again see that showing up it clearly was not a gift that she had been given to be able to do that and Paul took it away from her by expelling the demon. So we see it throughout both the old and the new. So by this logic, the only people who can successfully do any kind of magic uh, must necessarily not actually be able to. It's all demons. It all comes back to having an imaginary enemy and fighting that imaginary enemy all day long. Let me let me ask you this when you take all of the spiritual concerns away from the film like let's just push them to the side for a minute there were a number of other moments in the film as well um you mentioned one of them i i believe i heard the word stripper at one point in in the movie as well um what are some of those elements that parents should also just from from strictly a not being appropriate for kids perspective Absolutely. Here's the thing. The whole premise is this coming of age. And we all know it's common for teenagers to rebel against parents. The problem with the this the plot of this movie is that there's even a line at the end that says my panda my or, or, or my my <laughs> the my panda my choice line body my panda. And, you know, because the whole my thing panda, is my like, choice, you know, this this the my panda my choice if you're gonna if you're gonna be critical about the film if you're going to have ages of notes written about the film maybe get the quote right that could be very helpful what it means to become a woman is this red panda this other persona this fierce and so there's a, this is the problem i had there's an there's this embracing of that side and saying like, hey, I like to gyrate and dance this way. I like to do these things that you think are bad, you think are wrong, but I'm gonna embrace that and do it anyways. So there's just, what it's literally teaching your kids is, hey, I lie to you, but that it's okay because that's who I am. You that's not what the message was. The message there was not that it's okay for her to lie to her mom. The message there was that it was okay for her to be her own person. That didn't necessarily include lying. Lying is what she had to do for the longest time because she was trying to be the perfect child for her mom and also who she really was on the inside. The lying stopped when she embraced that other side of her, the more fierce, the more animalistic, whatever you want to call it. When she embraced that other side... That was the moment that the lying stopped. There was no excuse made for the lying other than it was a tool of necessity for a certain amount of time. And a fun one that you can always levy at a Christian, ask them, is there ever a virtuous lie? Can there be a virtuous lie? And if they say, no, there can never be a virtuous lie. Lying is wrong all the time. Then present them with this scenario. You are in the middle of Nazi Germany. You have been hiding Jewish refugees in your attic. German soldiers come to your house and ask you, are you hiding Jewish refugees in your attic? You have a rapport with them. You know that if you lie to them, they will leave and the refugees survive. But you also know you have a rapport with them. If you're honest about it, you may get levity for breaking the law. What is the virtuous action here? Which of these is the virtuous action? Is the virtuous action not lying and also not breaking the law? Or is the virtuous action keeping the hostage or cannot the hostage they are hostages of the country but keeping the refugees alive which of these two is the virtuous thing to do and if they say the lie as an action would outweigh the benefit of the lives preserved i'd say that's the point where you pack up and you leave that conversation and you literally 
just never speak to that person again from that point like you've you've literally had your litmus test right there as to whether this person is worthwhile as a human being. If they fail that litmus test so stupendously, then it's it's no longer time to have conversations. It's time to leave. And this is where we end up here. Is there a virtuous lie? Is a lie of self or other preservation virtuous? Can it be? In the case of the story. For the longest time, the person her mother was could not have accepted her wanting to keep the panda. Would not. None of the other family members would have either. She didn't really have a choice. You know, I dance in this sexually overt way, but you're just going to have to be okay with it because that's who I am. And it's that secular humanistic worldview that says there is no wrong or right anymore. It's like, hey, mom, this is my truth. This is what's right for me. That's not what that means. Oh, my God. There is no part of that that says it's uh, that it's right or wrong. The movie literally says it is right for her to be herself, the person who she is most comfortable as without harming other people. That is the message of the movie. When her mom is that person, she harms other people. And so it's not OK for her mom to be that person. But when the main character of the movie is that person, she doesn't hurt people. She actively enriches other people's lives. The message of the movie is that it is okay to be yourself, so long as that person isn't hurting others. The mom's truth, the mom's way of handling that was suppressing it for herself. But to argue that there is only one answer to the problem that everybody in that family faced in that movie, is to argue that everybody who exists is a carbon copy cutout of everyone else and all solutions are necessarily one size fits all. I hate to tell you this, but truth? Truth is that which corresponds with reality. The reality is she was a better, more well-rounded person after accepting her own flaws. But if you are a Bible believing Christian, this should this should be screaming red flags like turn this off. Stop brainwashing your kids with this. The Bible declares there is a right and there is a wrong. And Mike Signorelli's not the standard of it. God is and his word is. And the whole God is the bastion of what is right. Therefore, genocide is okay because god did a genocide once and he plans on doing it again creating a torture chamber where humans will be tortured for the entirety of existence with no recompense whatsoever is okay because god did it creating diseases like smallpox and aids to destroy humanity is okay because God did it. Those are good things, according to this logic. No, I refuse. I actively refuse to live in that reality. Movie, when you get to the, like the climax at the end, which by the way, the whole climax of this movie, the spoiler alert, is this massive ritual with this pentagram-esque circle that begins to illuminate. Pentagram esque. You know what else is pentagram esque? The Star of David. Is it pentagram esque or is it a pentagram? Because either it's a pentagram and you can be oh I'm super scared, or it's not a pentagram and shut the fuck up. And these demon spirits in the form of a panda coming out of them and doing all this stuff. I mean, it, it goes from like, if you were like, oh, I don't think this is demonic. Like, if you get to this scene, you're like, okay, there's no denying it. But then beyond that, there's this embracing of, hey, I, I did all these wrong things, but this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as a, a good. She did all of the wrong things because she was trying to hide from her mom. She was doing all of those wrong things. Well, let's actually talk about those wrong things. What things did she do that were blatantly wrong in the movie? Lying to her parents is probably the only really wrong thing she did. Throughout the movie, the actual actions she takes 
are not necessarily wrong. She utilizes her power for profit because there was a goal she wanted to meet. Does that necessarily a wrong thing to do here? She's not doing it to a scale where people are being exploited. So what's the actual issue here? The only real problem is the thing she was hiding from her mom, but the person she would have become if she hid those things from her mom would have been an equally flawed individual as all of the other family members in the movie who didn't embrace that other side of themselves. She would have been a worse person had she followed her mom's footsteps. So what's the actual problem there? Good parent, you just cannot co-sign that message. It's so dangerous. And I want to say one quick thing. You know, it all culminates to this song and there's this band that comes out and it's just like, I was thinking about Daniel when, you know, there was this idol worship and it said that in Babylon, there would be a song that would play. And every day that song would play and it would summon up this ritual of we're all going to bow down before this idol. And Daniel said, I'm fasting. I'm not going to do that. I serve the God of Israel. And it's so crazy to me that today these movies have the songs and it's like trying to get you to bow down to the idolatry of. The, the movie had songs. The movie had songs, therefore evil. The movie had a band in it that came up out of the ground at one point because that was their presentation style. Therefore, evil. Felicia Angel and Zada Hagala, thank you for the 100 bits each. But, yeah, music happened. Dude, you have a fucking guitar behind you. Come on, dude. Don't pull this shit. The movie has music, guys. Of worship of self, because that's essentially the worldview of this movie. And, I, and it's funny because so many parents are commenting on my post saying, my kid is watching this thing two to five times a day on repeat. Because that's what kids do with things they like. Oh my fucking God. I babysitted a kid when I was like 19 and the amount of times I watched Finding Nemo, the amount of times I watched Finding Nemo, holy shit, I cannot count them. That's what kids do with things they like. They watch them a lot. That's why it's honestly better to show your kid a long form TV show than it is to show them a movie. Because if they get sucked into the TV show, you will at least be saying that something different is on the TV every time. This is a kid thing. You have kids, my guy. Splinter Kid says, I've watched Frozen an unholy amount of time due to children. Yes. Like here, the best thing you can do it from somebody who's done babysitting, the best thing you can do with kids to save your sanity instead of getting them into a movie? Find a show you like. A, a cartoon show, specifically. It can be a long-form anime. It, it can be anything, but just make sure that it's age-appropriate for them. Turn it on and watch it. Make sure it's long, though. Don't, like... Don't fucking show your kids Madoka Magica, not just because it's not appropriate for them, but also because it's not a long show. Something long. Hamtaro is a really good example of this. Perfectly age appropriate for any kid for the most part. And the show is long as fuck. Pokemon. Perfectly age appropriate. Show's long as fuck. Do it. That Way easier. Way better than a movie. Kids watch things on repeat, dude. Find a way to make yourself sane. That doesn't mean they're being brainwashed into a satanic ritual. Dear God. And so what you're getting is not the song, but the ideology behind the movie. And the song is like the desire. Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. This stuff is so dangerous. Ron, my one half is not a thing to show to a five-year-old. I'm sorry. No, no, no. As somebody who watched Ron, my one half when I was five years old. No. That is not appropriate for a five-year-old. Well, listen, I appreciate you taking the time to break it down. Where can people find out more? All right, we don't need his plug. Instead of his plug, we're going to do our plug. If you're watching my show, please consider supporting the channel. Uh, biggest thing you can do is Patreon. That's like the, the biggest thing. 
The biggest thing is Patreon. Um, alternatively, there is also the Cuddly Octopus link in the description, as well as a link to DDLG Playground or even Wraith uh, if you want energy drinks. Uh, I'm sponsored by a handful of people. I don't know why they uh, tolerate me and my my stupid antics. But yes, I just this was literally just old man yells at cloud the segment. Uh, Soccer and Yan, thank you very much for the 100 bits cheer. Can I talk about something very scary that happened while we're on this topic before we end the segment? There are apparently people who watched my show with their kids around and now their kids like the weird cat lady on screen uh, voiced by a guy who is definitely not a lady. Um, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying why? Why? Jeebus. Anyways, as always, everybody, give me your thoughts in the comment section below. Give me your thoughts on, on this whole segment. This is a particularly long one. I feel bad for Cherry having to edit this one. I did not restrain myself anywhere near as much as I could or should have. But anywho, Lilith of Faith, thank you for the 100 bits of cheer. And as always, everyone, this was nuts. Incident video tagline here.